This is Cast of Wonders, the young adult fiction podcast featuring stories of the fantastic. Welcome! Episode 399 for January 25th, 2020. I'm Catherine Inskip, your host for this episode and editor at Cast of Wonders. Every year in January, Cast of Wonders highlights some of our favourite episodes from the previous year. It's a great chance for us to take a bit of a breather and let you, our listeners, catch up on any missed back episodes with new commentary from a different member of the crew. My staff pick from 2019 is Breaking by Maya Chabra, which originally aired as episode 370 on August 18th, 2019. Maya Chabra has had poems in Mythic Delirium, Abyss and Apex and Liminality, among other venues and short fiction in Anathema, Spec from the Margins. Her novelette for adults, Walking on Knives, is available from Less Than Three Press. She has a novella, Toxic Bloom, from Falstaff Books, and her translation from the Russian of Marina Sveteva's play Fortune appeared in Cardinal Points. This story is narrated by Nadia Niaz. Nadia Niaz is a writer, editor and academic, who teaches creative writing to everyone from preschoolers to postgraduates. She's a member of the West Writers Group and the founder of the Australian Multilingual Writing Project. When she's not working with words, she's either lifting heavy things or dancing. A quick content warning, this story deals with themes of terminal illness, grief and child mortality. And now we've a tale to tell. Breaking by Maya Chabra, read by Nadia Niaz. Mom's kind of bizarrely happy for someone with a daughter about to croak, but I don't mind. She saved my life. When I collapsed, I was still only 14, too young to have an imprint. If she hadn't found me in time, I would be dead already and gone. Now I'm safe, and they've pretty much stopped everything but palliative care. I'd like to be corporeal longer and grow human-wise, but there's nothing more they can do. I turned 15 two weeks ago, just four days after I entered the ward again. They backed me up as soon as midnight struck on the fastest clock in the building. We're Catholics, the whole family converted from Hinduism back in America when I was six, and not really supposed to stick around after, not when there's heaven out there, but in practice it doesn't work that way. Most Catholics get imprints done, same as everyone else, because computer immortality is a certainty and faith is a leap. Anyway, Mom did the best anyone could have done. The machine that demonstrated my neural maturity was her idea. She brought it in the ambulance. She's a bioengineer and amazingly clever. Today she brought me real food. Kichri, a bland mix of rice and dal, but I'm starving. Even sick person food is better here in Delhi than anything back home. Mom sent over the doctor's file when I had my mouth full. That's an old trick from when I was 12 and first diagnosed with cancer and badgered everyone for every bit of info and explanation. Not really needful now, and it almost made me cough, which wouldn't have stopped for hours if I had. I shut my eyes and swallowed, which took more time than it used to, and read. Only a few weeks? Be brave, Sarita. It's only for a little while, and then you'll wake up full of energy again, better than even before you got sick. Your cousin Nikhil wants to see you. Do you feel up to it? Why is he coming all the way over here? Mom's smile faded. You know why, Sarita. Nikhil flew all the way over from the States because I'm dying. In the old times, that meant never seeing a person again. For Nikhil, it still does. He has an ostentatious martyr's faith and hasn't had an imprint taken, ever. When he was my age, his parents tried to hold him down for one. My mom said they were all being idiots. Anyway, Nikhil's going to heaven when he dies, and for once, he wasn't a jerk about it. He didn't even tell me how sorry he was that we'd be parted in the afterlife, just joked that I was very brave for someone faced with spending all her future with the ancestors. Nikhil was actually awfully sweet yesterday. I want you to remember that if they don't have time to do another backup before I go and you're missing the last few days. 
That's why I'm saving this thought diary for you. For me, I mean, when I wake up on a computer with no cancer for the first time in years, meeting the ancestors in a whole new way. When I come back, even if I'm missing a tiny blip, I want to remember how much I hate him. It's easier to be brave now that I'm 15 and the threat of oblivion's past, but it's still a lot easier to get called brave, or a religious nutcase, I guess, for doing like Nikhil and walking around all pleased with your courage and independence, and what does he know about dying anyway? It's easy to say you don't want to stay on Earth forever when you've always had years and years of body time ahead. Sorry about that. They came in to give me a sedative a few hours ago and I just woke up. Without it, the pain sometimes stops me sleeping. Right now, I'm lying here recording this with my eyes shut and that's about as much activity as I feel up to. Dr. Alualia came to talk to me in person. It must have been a slow day. Sarita. I could see the last two and a half years passing over him. I hear you're nervous about the break. That's natural, especially for such a young woman. Mom asked you to... I didn't need to finish. How did she know anyway? I've been trying so hard to be good. I didn't even dare tell you my thought diary. Your mother knows this isn't an easy transition and that you'll need as much help as we can give you. I wouldn't be afraid if I understood it properly. I mean, I've been looking this stuff up ever since I fell ill. And I get the computer's bits. Mom's explained it in small words. We shared a grin. But how does your, you know, your soul get from one brain to another? Your soul? Would it help if I brought in a priest? I saw I'd put him in an awkward spot, as he was sick and I was Christian, so he felt a bit nervous about giving me religious advice. However, he'd mistaken my meaning, and a priest would be the worst thing at this time. We'd stopped going to church locally shortly after we moved here when we realized our church was locked in a vicious feud over land with the neighboring private school. The other church nearby did its services mostly in Hindi, which I didn't speak and my mother spoke badly. I explained all this to the bemused doctor and he asked if I'd noticed my thoughts wandering lately. After the break, they don't say die now that I'm so close to the line, they say break, which unnerves me a little. After the break, I won't have to worry about side effects from medicine. I'll have much bigger worries than that. Doctor, I said, if it weren't illegal, you could start running my backup now, couldn't you? Are you afraid it won't work? No, but if it could run at the same time I'm here, I wouldn't be in it, would I? He leaned his purple turbaned head on one hand and waited. I could feel myself become more and more agitated. I'd be right here in my head, and that would be a different me, that I couldn't be inside, right? He lifted his head and nodded. So what's the difference after I'm dead? What if I'm not in there? Sarita, I'm an oncologist, not a biomechanic. You ask your mother about the machine, okay? I've done what I can for you, but somehow we can beat death and not cancer. Why not? I asked, sitting up in bed. The room spun, too fast. The doctor seemed just as dizzied as me, though. Well, immortality took some of the urgency off it and some of the money. And Sarita, there's nothing so inventive as a human being. Cancer's just human tissue twisted out for itself. And it's as clever as anything human. Selfish, hiding where you least expect it. Short-sighted enough not to realize it's killing itself, too. I hated my body when he said that, but it bothered me more that he hadn't given me a reason to trust my new brain. Mom's gone for a walk to get out of the hospital for a bit. She and Dad came so close to losing me, enough to make you not want to have children. Not that I'm ever going to. Huh. I always wanted lots and lots of children. I wasn't going to be anyone's wise grandma over the screens the way I'd met my nani and nanu. Was I going to be anything over the screen? I'd spent so long just trying to make it to 15, and now it seemed like I would be replaced by... me. Another me. But I wouldn't be around to see it. That must be why they call it a break. 
my continuity would break, but only for me. Everyone else would have the other me to love and talk to and not cry over. I'm going to ask mom in the morning. I don't want to be a nervous wreck when I die, when I break. No one's supposed to die anymore. Mom came in early with dad. She wouldn't fucking answer. Do you understand? She answered sideways. You'll remember everything, sweetheart, brave girl. You love and feel as much as you ever did. No, I won't. You will. I'll be dead, old time dead. Everybody dies old time dead. The living just don't notice anymore. They must know. Mom must know at least. But they block it out somehow. Or they don't know enough of how the tech works and so they figure immortality is for real. Do you have any idea how much I hate you? You wait there, dormant for the day I finally croak and you wake up to your blissful, pain-free life. Right now, I can't focus for more than five minutes. They've got me sedated most of the day. It's for the best, I know, but I feel like my life's slipping away while I sleep. I mean, it is. You have no idea what it's like when your own body turns on you like this. You have no idea what bodies are. I am a body. You won't be me. I hate you. Except you're me. You're nothing but what I've put into you. My memories. My thoughts. My life. I asked them not to sedate me today. Without the sedative, I couldn't sleep at all. I hurt too much. That was part of the plan. God, I'm so ashamed now. But I have to tell you, because this is the most important thing. This is the thing you can't lose at the break. Mom taught me everything about backups. When the cancer came back, I was fascinated by them. They were my future. I knew how to use them, how to mend them, how to wreck them. I wheeled my IV along with me, guided by the tiny light of my backup, fluttering on, off, on, off, across the darkened room. I had a rupee coin clutched in my other hand, sweat slick. I took the backup down from its shelf and brought it back to bed with me. It buzzed a little, a thrumming sound, and it was warm. I clutched it to my stomach like a hot water bottle. I was always cold now. Come on, Sarita, get it together. Don't get sentimental now. I pulled it away from my body and used the rupee coin to prise it open, just like my mother had taught me. I moved aside clumps of wires, searching for the plastic-encased heart, the chips on which my data was encoded. Panic bubbled up as I couldn't find it. What if it was all a lie and they hadn't taken my imprint after all? My hands searched wildly, feeling their way in the dark. I felt smooth plastic, a little pouch with wires running in and out. My breathing returned to normal. Just a little panic. Normal, when you go against society this way. Normal when you know you're going to die. Tears streamed down my face. I was on the verge of sobbing, but held back as much as I could. I didn't have the strength to be torn apart by breathless sobs for the next hour or so, which was what would happen if I wasn't careful. I was doing what God wanted me to, but that's not why I was doing it. Still, I prayed over that little heart right before I smashed it. Taking the IV out of my arm as carefully as I could in the dark, I closed my hands around the light metal stand. I stood up so fast my head spun and battered that little bit of plastic, you, with the metal pole, until it cracked open and the chips were exposed. I was on the floor feeling for them when the door cracked open. Sarita, are you all right? Dr. Aluvalia turned on the light and I shut my eyes against the burning. They already hurt from crying. I knew you were up to something when you refused the sedative, he said gently, coming towards me. Now the tears came in earnest, and I couldn't breathe, but my hands still searched out the chips and clutched them. Dr. Aluvalia couldn't get there fast enough to stop me from breaking them if I wanted to. Sarita, stop! Think of what you're doing! I have thought about it, I shrieked, with a rage that surprised me. I've thought about nothing else. It's a lie. It's all a lie. I'm going to die and no one will care because they'll still have me. But I won't have me. I'll be dead. You're not a child anymore. That's why you can do a backup. 
I, I wish I'd known earlier. I wish you'd told me. I wish you'd had to hold me down like Nikhil. None of you want to see. You're not a child, he said, sharp enough to cut through my rant. It's not you they did the backup for. Silence, except for my shuddering, painful sobs. The backup is for your parents. Do you want them to lose you entirely? Sarita, we don't do the backups for immortality. That's a fool's dream and anyone who's looked into it closely knows it. But what harm is there in leaving some comfort to our loved ones? The sobs continued, but I was listening. It won't be you who wakes up, though the new you won't know that. She will, I thought. I've left something for her to know by. But will you be brave and pretend for your parents? They know, but they don't want to frighten you. If we all pretend, we can avoid the kind of scenes that made the old time dying so awful. It would be more honest to have those awful scenes, but he knelt by me and cupped his hands, and I dropped the still intact chips into them. And gradually, they'll forget she's not you. I nodded through my sobs. Part of me wanted them to grieve for me forever, to never stop thinking of me and missing me, the real me. But I thought of my cousin's parents trying to hold him down, their fear, and if my imprint would bring my parents comfort, if the not me on a screen gentled the pain any, how could I be so selfish as to want to destroy it? I was dead either way. Dr. Aluvalia held me close to him for a moment, then reinserted the ivy into my arm and took the chips to be put in a new machine. My parents haven't found out about that night. I don't think they will. I don't have that long now. But you'll know. And you'll know what you have to do. What I would do. I want to tell them the truth. About what I feel, about what I fear. That I'm terrified, that I love them, that I'm okay but truth rips everything up and is proud of the destruction. Better to lie. It's only for a few more days. Is it courage or cowardice that we won't face reality? I don't know. All I know is I'm not Nikhil. I can't trust the hearts of my loved ones to God's mercy and wash my hands of it. I have to do what I can. And so will you. I've already had my say on this story once before, so I'm going to take a different slant on it this time around. In Sarita's world, memory, consciousness and soul have apparently been tamed. A human mind can be quantified, calibrated, stored and given new life. But not if you're a child. The reason given comes down to neurological maturity. What it also suggests to me is potential. As children, we have the same kind of sense of identity as we do as adults. Less developed, perhaps, but very much there. I've changed and grown a lot over my life, but I can still trace that continuity back to being a two-year-old, coming downstairs and realising that Catherine was a name that meant me, and suddenly that others were individuals as well. And I know my son went through a related crunch point on the cusp of his third birthday, because he was a two-year-old, and becoming three was something new and scary for him. As an autistic child, being a three-year-old was viscerally not part of his identity. Adults can sometimes forget how strongly children know themselves, or see how much change they have to adapt to as they grow. And that adaptability is an amazing thing. We gather a lot of inertia as we age, Maybe being too young for an imprint is a good thing, because your mind can't be stored, can't be predicted, can't be contained. This is also a story about privilege. Sarita's mother uses her resources and her privilege to gift her daughter with the potential for extended existence. But not every terminally ill child in that world gets that chance. Here in the UK, we have a national health service that we're desperately proud of. Care is given at the point of need, regardless of wealth or circumstance. But it's critically under-resourced right now, and its future uncertain. So, should we live to see a future where technology like Sarita's backup imprint exists, 
Maybe it will be an option for everyone. But maybe it won't. Technology has the power to do amazing things, to save us from all kinds of disasters, personal or external. But it won't save everything or everyone on its own. And it's rarely the case that children get a say in what to save. Sarita took that choice into her own hands. And I think she chose well. Join us again next time when our editor Marguerite Kenner will bring you her favourite story of the year. We love bringing you the best audio fiction week after week, but we can't do it without your support. Your donations pay our authors, our narrators, our servers and our staff. Please consider supporting us with a monthly donation through either PayPal or Patreon. You can also review us, request us on Spotify and consider the stories we publish for award consideration. There are lots of ways you can help. Join the discussion on the EA forum, forum forum.escapeartist.net or visit on Twitter at Cast of Wonders. Come say hello. Cast of Wonders is a production of Escape Artists Incorporated and is brought to you by Editors Marguerite Kenner and Catherine Inskip Assistant Editors Andrew K. Ho and Carissa Sloss Associate Editors Tonya Bespalco, Amy Brennan, Alicia Caparasso, Trace Fontil, William Haight Minor, Sean Proctor, Ray O, Susie Rodriguez, Emma Smales and Chris Tang. Our art director is Alexis Goebel, our community manager Danny Daly, and our audio producer is Jeremy Carter. Our episodes are released under the Creative Commons Attribution Non-Commercial No Derivatives 4.0 International Licence. That means you can download or listen to the episode on any device you like, but you can't change it or sell it. Our theme music is Appeal to Heavens by Alexi Nov, available from Promo DJ or his Facebook page. Thank you for listening.